Okay, hi everyone. Uh, that's yet another session for uh, for us to to enjoy. A session of the green room, a peaceful space uh, for progressive minds. We don't shout. Uh, we don't throw uh, things that are offensive. We talk, and we talk about uh, many aspects of of our lives, uh, including arts. Uh, politics, yes, sometimes, a social life and so forth and, and so on. Uh, I'm so glad that theater department uh, came up with, with this idea and, and, and this is what, what, we, what we can treasure to today. A session with uh, Hill Harper, who will be introduced in, in a moment uh, uh, by our students. We have army of, of students uh, involved in, in uh, running this, this discussion, and they will introduce themselves in, uh, in a sec. Again, I'm thrilled. Look, this is a day. This is this is incredible day. If you have been watching the news, and um, I'm sure you uh, you have, that's the, the day is like buy one get two. We knew that we will have Hill Harper today, but who knew that we will have a new president elected just today before this session? So this is very historic moment and and joyful moment and uh, like leaving uh, politics aside. Uh, I know some of us were waiting for for that moment. Uh, some of us four days. Some of us four years. Let's leave it aside. Uh, now it's the time to, to, to celebrate uh, our guest speaker and I will uh, uh, pass my torch to, 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 to our students. Hey everybody, uh, thank you for joining our green room session uh, this Saturday. Uh, myself and four other students will help lead discussion. Um, so I'm going to quickly let everybody introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Derek, by the way. Sorry about that. I'm Chip. I'm Danny. I'm Katie. I'm Saud. Perfect. And without further ado, our guest today is currently starring on ABC's hit drama, The Good Doctor. He has been nominated for Best Lead Actor for his role that he played on the, in the film, The Visit. You may also recognize him uh, from his role on CSI New York and many, many more. He is not only an award-winning actor, he has also earned three Ivy League de degrees. He is also a New York Times bestselling author, a philanthropist, an activist. Please let me introduce Hill Harper. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey you guys. Um, I'm really excited for this. Uh, you know, Professor Omar, thank you. And, and, and Derek, thank you for that. I'm excited because I feel connected to Williams College. And I'll tell you why, and you guys will think this is really silly, but I just have to be honest and tell you. So I went to undergrad at Brown and I went to grad school at Harvard. And, when, and my first semester in grad school, I met this girl from Williams College, who went to Williams College. And I fell in love with her and we started dating. And she would always tell me about Williams College and how great it was. And she'd always wear her Williams College, you know, sweat top, blah, 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 blah. We dated for a while. We ended up breaking up, but we're still friends, which is good, even to this day. And she has kids and she's like, like a superstar. And um, so even though I've never been there, even though, you know, I, I don't, you know, whatever. Point is, I've always felt a kinship to Williams College. Um, well, come home. Then. So thank you. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Exactly. It's taken a long time, but, <laughs> but um, this is a lot of fun. And so I appreciate it. You know, obviously, it's, this is a very historic day. I've known um, Senator Harris since 2007. We met on the campaign trail. I actually went to, you know, I went to law school with uh, Barack Obama. And, you know, obviously, we're, we're, the, we're the same class, but I went straight from undergrad to grad school. And he had taken about seven years off in between undergrad and grad school before he came back to grad school. And so we've been friends for a long time. And he, he asked me when he was running for president, when he was a senator at the time, he was like, Hill, will you go to Iowa? I was actually born in Iowa and he knew that. So he's like, 
will you go to Iowa and will you work Iowa for me, man? Will you, will you hit the, hit, 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 pound the pavement, knock on doors, speak at every church, particularly the black community. We need, since Iowa during the primary is a caucus state, organizing is really important. And obviously Georgia proves that organizing is important with what Stacey Abrams did with organizing. But ultimately um, when, when you're doing a caucus, especially if you can just have an incredible ground game or organizing game, you can really do, do very well. And, you know, he didn't think that he had a path to victory if he couldn't win Iowa. So he asked me and several other people, including Kamala, to go to Iowa and spend a lot of time there. So she and I crossed paths a lot because we were doing the exact same work there in Iowa in 2007, leading up to the caucus and, and became friends. And she's, you know, she's wonderful and magnificent. She's done, a, 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 you know, she's carved out a great career. And, you know, we talk about shattering glass ceilings and clearly uh, today and her, her tenure as a, as a VP represents the, the a, a beginning of shattering glass ceilings. Um, you know, I think that uh, obviously we need more, significantly more female leadership throughout uh, business, entertainment, politics, et cetera, and, uh, and women of color uh, uh, throughout that. So needless to say, it's a great day. And, and obviously all the other reasons, um, you know, that we, we don't have to get into here. Cause I'd rather really talk about things that you guys care about. I don't know how many of you are, prof are planning to be professional actors and do what I do as a profession um, versus you just love the craft and you love studying it or you're just starting to study it. And so I would rather kind of hear from you and, and we can have a discussion, but let me set the set a bedrock or a framework for the discussion if I could. And, and basically tell a little bit of a story for me is that when I went to undergrad, um, I took a class my first semester freshman year called Theater Arts 21, taught by Professor Barbara Tannenbaum. It was called Voice for the Actor Shakespeare. So they're using Shakespeare just to help with exploring your voice, voice as an actor, the way you use your voice. So she taught a lot of link ladder technique and other things about releasing your voice. I just thought it'd be fun. I took the class, there was an opening and I fell in love. I fell in love with, with acting. I fell in love with what it was. But at th that time I, you know, I had no family in the entertainment business. I didn't know, I, you know, I didn't know how do you build a career or, or make the, even the choice to build a career as an actor. So I continued taking classes, can, you know, continue doing theater at Brown. Um, I won a Sloan fellowship to study public policy and public administration. So, um, and I had a roommate who kept talking about law school. And so I was like, well, maybe, you know, that could be interesting to explore. At the time, LA Law was on, you guys are too young for this, but LA Law was a big, big show. And, and Blair Underwood, who I've since worked with and become friends with a number of occasions. But at the time he was like this young uh, 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 lawyer on this show. And I, I was like, oh, maybe that'd be cool. You know, I, you know, it'd be fun. So I decided to do a joint degree and get my law degree and my public administration, my master's in public administration, but, and joined a black repertory company in Boston. So I would keep doing theater. And just over time, uh, grad school just bought me time to sort of mature uh, myself of, and, and get a, a more confidence and more understanding of who I wanted to be and what type of life I wanted to live. And also learn about not necessarily allowing other people's voices to dictate my choices. And, um, and kept going down to New York, taking the train from Boston to New York to audition for things meet people, um, you know, do productions and do different things, dancing, different things like that. And, um, and it became, and, 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 and the journey became less of a mystery. You know, I, I started to realize there was a path for me to do this if, if that's what I wanted to do. At the same time, all these people were in my ear saying, you know, you have, you know, over six figures in student loan debt, you know, what are you thinking? Take, take a job as a lawyer, you do that job for a while, pay off your debt, then do what you want, which is so interesting to me. Even just think about the logic of that. The idea that people were projecting the idea that say, do this, even though that's not what you really wanna do, so you can 
pay off these loans or whatever, and then do the, and, and, and so a couple things. Number one, I believe if you're ever making a choice that's based off money alone, then it's the wrong choice. Um, and I would have been doing that, meaning I would have made a choice based off money alone. Now, certainly considering money or, or the realities of living is always a factor in your choice rubric, but if that's the primary choice, it's probably the wrong one, um, unless you're like people that, you know, that, that, that just got, just lost their job today. So that's a good thing. Um, so, 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 so the idea of making choices about expanding who you are and, and, and following your heart and, and asking yourself questions throughout your life, because these answers can change. What makes your heart beat faster? what makes your heart beat faster when you think about spending time doing it? And that's a simple question, but the, the answers aren't easy. And I think oftentimes we can conflate simple and easy and they're two different things. Asking ourselves the really simple questions, very important. Knowing that the answers that come aren't always easy and being able to decipher the difference um, I, is very important. And so um, making really courageous, risk-filled choices is not easy, but it's oftentimes the simplest choice, following your heart. And certainly where you are now, you're, you're, you, I believe that you all, and we can dive deeper into what I'm about to say, because I don't hear a lot of people saying this. And if you want to talk about it more, we can. Your generation is the first generation that's going to live long enough, barring some horrible pandemic, um, is going to live long enough to be able to do three or even four completely different things over your journey. I'm talking about three or four different 20 to 30 year choices of what you do with your time. So it allows you to think about your choice rubric completely differently. This is a time for you, I believe, to over-index what society would call over-indexing, but for you not, your risk-taking. If there, whatever is the, the moonshot or most risky choice that's in your heart, this is a wonderful time to spend the next 10 to 15 years exploring that because Think about it. You'll be able, most of you are going to live to be 140, 150 years old. And I mean that, right? You just look, think of, I know it's hard to wrap your head around it, but think about life trajectory in the way, just the way, you know, it's going like this, right? And so if you're going to live that long and you guys are 20, 21, 22, 23, whatever, you got another 120 years. So you could spend doing three different 30 year careers or whatever you want to call it. I even hate the label career, but, but um, you know, what you spend your time doing in your life with another five to 10 years in between each um, studying and learning about doing something different. And if you, if you buy into that idea, which is, I think, truth, then it allows you to exhale and make choices based off your heart. And certainly easier said than done, but it takes discipline to do that and courage. And we can dive deeper into that. Um, but I wanted to lay the groundwork with that type of conversation. And if we want to talk about the, 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 the trajectory and advice around being a professional actor, we can talk about that. If we want to talk about life and life choices, we can talk about that. If we just want to talk about you know, being happy and figuring things out as we go, we can talk about that. Whatever, wherever you guys want to go. But I wanted to lay the groundwork with that discussion because I truly believe that um, as an actor and making a choice to do what I do, one of the key pieces is to stay vulnerable and to keep your heart open. You can't do it very well if you don't remain vulnerable. And that's what I love about being an actor because it forces you to stay in that space. And it also, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of hurt involved because if you choose this as a path professionally, there's a lot of rejection. 
So you, you're, you're very open, but you get rejected a lot more than you get accepted. That's part of the journey. And so you, you know, navigating that journey is part of it as well. So uh, with that said, I just wanted to, to lay a little groundwork. However you guys, the moderators want to handle our discussion, um, feel free and, and let's dive into some stuff. Perfect. We can, uh, we can open up the floor for questions. I know some of our uh, student discussion leaders have uh, some questions that they want to ask first, and then we can open it afterwards to the audience. So um, starting with Chip, maybe. So you've created a lot of social impact outside of your work on the screen, even. Um, I know through the Manifest Your Destiny Foundation, um, I was wondering, do you see your commitment to social justice in your work on the screen as intertwined um, in like, how, how do you use it as an avenue um, to impact social change with your acting? That's a, great, that's a great question. And, and so they call you Chip, but your name is Chander Payne? Uh, yeah, my name's Chander. Um, my mom's Indian, um, but oh, Chip is my okay. nickname. That's a great name. Chander Payne, that is, people will think that you made that up. That's like a great actor's name. In fact, can I Thank use your name? I'm gonna change my name to Chander Payne. I think that's a great name. Okay. So uh, I think that the, the acting and the activism are inextricably linked. I, early on in my career, I had the wonderful blessing that Spike Lee hired me to do a movie called Get on the Bus, which was a, about a black man taking a bus trip from Los Angeles to DC for the Million Man March. And in that movie, um, when we were shooting the scenes, Spike wanted everybody on the bus, whether you're in the scene or not, because you, as you're shooting the scene, you could see people have to be in their seats. And on a bus trip, you know, you stay in the same seats. And I had, my character had the wonderful blessing of sitting next to Ozzie Davis's character. And Ozzie Davis is a legendary actor who was an activist. And I got to talk to him for weeks on end. It was a master class in life. And he would tell me about having Malcolm X over to his house for dinner and, 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 and meetings. And, and he would talk about being married to Ruby D, who was another actress who was an activist. Uh, they both have passed on at this point, but he would talk about Godfrey Cambridge, who's a legendary black theater actor in New York, um, who railed against racism and he played a role called the Watermelon Man at one point, obviously steeped in, 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 in race and racism and all of these things. And so he, you know, Ozzy said very clearly that actors like Paul Robeson, actors like Harry Belafonte, actors like himself, if you're gonna do this journey use whatever platform you have, whether it's big or small, to help with social change and also help with the way black men and black people are perceived and, 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 and also how we perceive ourselves and, and how we see ourselves. And so um, I've always seen these things as completely, completely linked. And, um, and and, and that's, some, that's a piece of being an actor that I'm very proud of because it impacts choices. You know, there are certain roles over the course of my career, particularly earlier in my career that I passed on that would have made me a lot more famous and a lot wealthier, but I didn't like the message the project sent about uh, us as a people. And, um, and I don't begrudge the actors that took those roles because I'm not in their business, right? I, I don't know what bills they have to pay. I don't know what responsibilities they have. I can just judge myself. And, and, uh, and so I, there's, there's, you know, you on a daily basis, we're faced with so many different choices. And I think that if you run them through the filter of, are you making choices that support humanity, support um, your community, that support um, equity, support inclusion, support art, support progress, as an actor, you can make those choices every day. And I think as an individual, you could work at IBM or Cisco or Facebook and make those choices. You know, there's plenty of people who, who quit or protested at Facebook because of things that they didn't agree with. So you can make those choices no matter what career you choose. But I think that those are some of the questions and some of the filter that you ask yourself in the choices that you make. Thank, Thank you for that question. Thank you. Now I'm going to hand it over to, I think Danny's next. Danny has a question. Hi. So 
I just have a quick question about like, I guess your acting. So how do you prepare yourself to embody your characters? Do you do like some research beforehand or like watch certain movies or read like certain novels? Like how, how do you like truly immerse yourself? Great question. Um, so I, you, use, you use every tool at your disposal. Um, research first, that's the bedrock to me and experiential research first before you watch. I don't, I'm not a big fan of watching stuff because that's someone else's version of whatever that is. Like if you, got, if you get cast in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, I don't think you should go watch, you know, Kathleen Turner's version of that, right? That's not your first. You could watch it at some point if you want and maybe, you know, pick up a little things here and there, but that should be the last thing you do. First, do your own research experientially, right? Whatever you can do. If your character is homeless, then interview folks, spend time volunteering at a homeless shelter. Um, go hang out in the community, ask people questions. The film, The Visit that, that was shared, my character is in prison dying of AIDS and it was based off a true story. And I kept that, I kept his obituary, my character's real life obituary above my door in my trailer. And I would touch it every time I went to the set. But to prepare for that. So what I wanted to do, number one, I'd never been to prison at that point. I'd visited prisons, but I'd never, spent time a lot of significant time so i wanted to go interview and talk to, to to brothers who were were inside and spend a decent amount of time so i did that but then i also needed to spend a decent amount of time with pe people who were suffering this is years ago before a lot of the wonderful medical advancements of 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 hiv and aids cocktails and drugs and, and therapies that we have now that extend life and um and so I wanted to talk to folks who were, who were suffering and certain things that you pick up in the interviews and talking to people or spending time with people you can use. For instance, it's never spoken or said in that movie, but one of the interviews, one of the people I talked to on AIDS is they said, there's this, they have this pain in their foot that feels like someone's putting a hot poker in the bottom of their foot. And that was so resonant to me in doing the research that I was able to use that idea. And because what you want to do is whatever comes to you is not replicated literally, but replicated in your body. And however, that kind of makes sense to you. If someone says, I always taste metal in my mouth, you don't have to, you know, literally put steel in your mouth. But what is, what would, how does that, what is that, how does that, how does your body or your instrument, which is your body as an actor, your, your, you know, how does that play in your instrument? So in my case, I would, I would always mash my foot, my right foot into the ground and it would shake a little bit and, I, and, and, and create heat. And so you'd never see it because the camera's way above it, but my, my lower leg, and like you could do it right now as you're sitting in your chair, take your, the, your right foot as you're sitting, mash it as hard as you can into the ground and just hold it there. I'm doing it right now you'll notice that your leg starts to shake a little bit if you do it long enough, if you flex it and do it and, you're, and you do it. And so what happens if you do that and you're doing a scene? It starts to impact the way you talk. It starts to, your voice gets a little shakier. It starts, and so you could, I, could, I could amplify it by how much I tense to my foot or I could bring it down by how little, depending on what level, how bad off he was at that time. And you know, as his, as his uh, disease, uh, implications got worse and worse and worse. And then also I wanted to lose weight during that movie. So I had to change the way I ate and I literally, for, you know, I tried to lose about 25 to 30 pounds over the course of the film, like while I was shooting and we tried to shoot in order. So you could see physically me wasting away and you just had to stop eating basically just drink water and eat lettuce. And you know, that, it, I'll tell you, it's not very healthy, but it works. You know, if all you do is eat iceberg lettuce and drink water, you know, I, I don't recommend it, but it works. Uh, you'll waste away. So um, the 
so so needless to say you use everything at your disposal but don't think literally about it think about how it plays into your instrument and then you can start watching stuff you know if you're like you know what i want a couple more ideas about how someone else does something similar or whatever because you're right no matter what character you're playing there's someone who's most likely played a character similar to it if not that specific character so you there you could see something that would be that would give you ideas and that's okay to take ideas i mean people the best actors are stealing ideas from other actors all the time so you know that's part of the game thank you katie Hi, I would love to hear a little bit more about um, your intersection of the skills you've learned um, in both your acting and writing careers um, and how they relate and how the creativity is displayed similarly or differently. You know, writing, good writing, let me put it this way, good writing requires such a level of discipline and, 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 I guess simultaneous vulnerability and meticulousness that is painful. It's, it's, it's painful because you have to rewrite because good writing is just rewriting to be quite honest. And, and the reason why we see, the reason why we see, I believe mostly poor writing out there, whether it's screenplays or novels or, you know, op-eds or whatever articles is because people agonize over the first draft so much that by the time they finish the first draft, they're exhausted and they're like, Ugh, let me just clean this up and I can't do it anymore. Rather than just getting the first draft done and then rewriting it about 50 to 100 times because good writing is in, in, in the precision and in the willingness to cut things out that you love. And you know, being a great writer is almost akin to me in film or television as being a great editor. And so, most actors aren't good editors because they're like, I don't want to cut that, you know, I don't want to cut me down, you know, whatever, or I don't want to be on someone else's face while I'm delivering my best lines. But what if the story demands the reaction is more than seeing the close up of you delivering this long monologue? So in the as an actor, I've had to let my ego go about that because just the way certain things are set up, I may be, you know, I may have worked all this time for this amazing monologue and and the director or the editor decides to cut away and see the person reacting to it. And you're just hearing my voice. And I'm like, what the way I, I, you know, and so, but I don't even think about that anymore. But the, the same goes with writing that you work so hard to write something, whether it's your first draft or second draft, and you're like, oh, I worked so hard on that paragraph. I don't want to read it. And, but oftentimes cutting something and rewriting and, challenging yourself can you can you make that whole paragraph one line you know can you challenge yourself to do that and and so every word starts to to be important and every sentence is important and it's not just filler and fluff and you're like well shit if i, if I cut it down that much i want to you know i'm supposed to write 20 pages and now i only have three exactly you have three really good pages and then can you can you can you rinse and repeat again write 20 get it down to three or four and then now you have six kick-ass pages that hurt because you went through so much. And then you do the same thing. And so when you see great writing like Toni Morrison and, 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 and just you know, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez and you know, these, these, these people that are writing on a level that is just different. I'm wearing a shirt that says Alchemist. I don't know if you see it. So I love Paulo Coelho. You know, they're writing on, on a level that they've edited and cut it down and cut it down to a, then that's to a point, but something like Paulo Coelho, for instance, he's come out with so many books now that you start to doubt he's really doing that, what he was doing early on in his career. He's like, you know, now he's more of an industry. Um, but the, you know, you just can't spit these things out quickly if they're really good. You just can't. And um, when I wrote my last book, I vowed I'd never write another book because it was so painful. It was horrible. And every time I finish a book, I say, I'll never do another one. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I will do another one because the last time I really, I just was like, I can't do it. It hurts, writing hurts and it hurts, it does. Acting hurts because of rejection, writing hurts because the actual pain in the process. 
Um, and you got to make yourself do it. And that's the thing. You have to cut the time out. You, you know, it's almost like you have to be so meticulous and so time driven. Like I, even if two sentences come out, I'm going to sit here for five hours. I also like to use legal pads. I just think that there's, we can get, I, I think, you know, don't kill me for what I'm about to say. But I think oftentimes technology can be an impediment to you, to a pathway to your heart. And whether you write with longhand or you talk it as an idea, I like to write my inspirations through my phone and send myself an email or whatever. And that's because, because inspiration, you got to remember, sometimes you get inspiration, whether it's about a character, whether it's about something you're writing or whatever, don't think that that's going to stay around, right? You are gifted it. Make sure you record it. So that's key. Whether you record it verbally or you wake up in the middle of the night and you send yourself an email. I send myself emails with the same subject matter. So let's say I'm working on a book called, you know, Edison's, Edison's Way. That's the book, right? So I'll, I'll always tag Edison's Way as my subject matter, my email to myself with a little line that sort of represents the, the kernel of the idea. And then once I have enough kernels of these ideas, I'll start writing about the kernel. I'll start expanding on that kernel of the idea. And then if, if more ideas start flowing out of the kernel, I know I have something. If, if, it, if it stops, the ideas stop, then it's okay. I don't judge myself. I don't beat myself up. Oh, that was a cool kernel. Maybe I'll use it somewhere else, but it's not really flowing here. And so, but you, you'll end up over the course of time with about two or 300 of these paragraphs of subject ideas that you can start to weave together and plot together and move around. And, and so that's, that's part of the creative process. Make sure you record those and don't think they're going to stick around till you have your writing session and then use them in your writing session. But, and, but, so. Thank you so much. I don't know if any of what I just said made sense. I hope it did. I, I it did. It was very helpful. Thank okay. you. Now I'm going to hand it off to Saud. Thanks, Derek. And thank you, Hill, for being here. Uh, my question is sort of about going back to your academic trajectory. Uh, so after college, you went to uh, grad school and including like a law degree from Harvard. Was this sort of because after college, you didn't really know what the next step for you was. So, you know, grad school felt like a safe option or was it because you already knew you wanted to be an actor, but, you know, you wanted like a backup or something to fall back on? No, if that yeah. didn't work out. first, it was the first. I wanted to buy some time. To, to get more clarity. And grad school was very, a, a very safe option for that because it feels like you're still making some type of progress. You're also learning things because I'm always an advocate for learning, right? I don't care. Okay, let's put it this way. I believe the biggest mistake we make about education, and I can't speak about other countries, but I'm gonna say in this country is that we, too closely align education with what you do as a profession or a career. Those things should have nothing to do with each other, right? The idea to me of education is building a foundation educationally, become a more learning human, so you actually have more options than less. And the way we articulate it though to people, and this is why I think a lot of young people are like, they don't feel that excited about education, they're like, yo, you're actually subconsciously trying to reduce my options. If I study to be an engineer, you, you're, you're making me feel like I got to be an engineer. It's just not true. Study to be an engineer, it gives you the option to be an engineer, but you also have the option to do anything else. But we tell people, oh, you, you studied, you have an engineer degree. I assume you're going to apply for engineering jobs. Bad assumption. So, so to me, I wasn't trying to do backup plans or anything like that. Because to me, backup plans are fear-based choices, right? And if you, again, if you're making decisions based off of fear, then it's the wrong decision. I wanted to continue to progress and there was an opportunity presented that seemed to be interesting. It's like, hmm, the laws always seem kind of interesting to me. I wonder if I'd enjoy it. Let me explore that. I saw this guy on TV who was like a Harvard Law grad on this TV show, and I think he's pretty cool. So, you know, whatever. I mean, I, that's very simplistic. And, but the point is, is that it, I ended up taking classes that were super interesting. 
I took women in the law, civil rights in the law, all of these things. And people, even in law school, were looking at me, yo, man, you know, there are no, there are no real corporate jobs in, you know, Native American law, dude. Why are you taking, it, it was like me and six people in the class, you know, and everybody else, 500 people in the corporate law class. I didn't care, right? I wanted to just study stuff that was interesting to me and learn things that was in. If I was going to go to school, I was at least going to study stuff that was interesting. So that's why public policy was great because it was interesting. And that's why the certain law to, law classes I took. Were, I mean, obviously there were certain things I had to take, you know, particularly as a 1L or your first year, you have to take a set set of courses, torts, civil procedure, blah, blah. And then in the second year, you have to take constitutional law you know, all of that stuff. So you have to take certain things, but then you have electives. And my electives, I just elected to do stuff that was interesting. And I wasn't doing it as a fallback. Um, I was doing it as just an exploration. Now, about two years in, it became clear to me that I didn't want to do practice law, but I kept trying different things. I went and tried to... Uh, <laughs> And, and again, just because you make a choice to do something doesn't mean you're wedded to it or you have to stay. For instance, I was like, well, maybe it would be interesting, you know, I want to do something about criminal justice reform and working from the prosecutor side could be interesting. What if I was a really progressive prosecutor? So I was like, oh, let me intern as a summer associate at uh, um, a U.S. attorney's office, federal prosecutor's office. So I chose the one in Chicago. I lasted four days. I was like, this is horrible. And I don't want to be involved in any of what these people are doing. And it was, you know, and you know, so I was like, I'm out of here. So just because I, I applied and done all these interviews and got in and blah, 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 doesn't mean you have to, you have to stay either. If it doesn't, if it doesn't align with who you are and your values and what you want to do, then it's like, you know what, PC later. And people are like, what are you going to do the rest of your summer? I was like, I don't know, but I'm definitely not doing that. Um, so when I came out of grad school, I took a job as a waiter waiting tables from 11 at night to seven in the morning at a, at a very popular um, 24 hour diner because I wanted my days free, but I still need to make earn, earn money. So I was a guy with two graduates from Harvard, both of them with honors, waiting, you know, slinging burgers and milkshakes and fries. And, um, you know, some of the best people I met after grad school were the people I worked with. Um, I got the nickname Zapato because the Latino brothers always thought that I was standing on the stuff they needed to clean. So they're like, Zapato, Zapato, meaning, you know, shoes, right? So it was like, move your feet, man. And so they started calling me Zapato. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, don't think about plan Bs, please, please, please. Not, life isn't about plan B's. Life is about affirmative choices, which can change, right? You make a choice to do this. If something's not working the way you want, invariably there will be other options that come up and then you choose that other option. But I don't think you do things, study whatever you wanna study. And if you need time, that you wanna buy time to progress, that's fine. Use grad school as that. I mean, that's, grad school is a great thing, but you could also use, you know, going to Tuscany to work on a, at a winery to, 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 to do that too, right? So it doesn't have to be education, uh, traditional or formal education. Let me put it that way. Um, obviously, there's, there's a different level of information that's available to all of you now that wasn't available to me at the time. What do I mean by that? Any, you know, since you guys are smart, learned people, anything you want to learn about, you can learn about with by clicking a few buttons right now, right? And having the ability to discern truth, truth from lies. That wasn't the case for me. I mean, I, I was going to school at a time where, um, obviously, the, you know, I wasn't, computers did exist. I wasn't like dying and the internet did exist, but it wasn't to the extent of information, free information, availability as it is now. So um, all that's to say, no plan Bs, please. No plan Bs. I Thank like you. that, that no was... plan Bs. <laughs> yeah, that was really inspiring. Thank you. At this point, uh, I'm going to open the 
for the rest of the audience to ask any questions. I know many of the moderators would love to keep asking questions, but the rest of the audience is allowed to now ask questions. I think they've all been put to sleep. <laughs> They're a little shy. <laughs> Omar, do you have one? Of course, I have gazillion questions. I'm, 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 I'm so needy. Uh, Hill, when you'll be running for president? Oh man, um, I'll tell you, there is, there, I've always asked myself the question around how can you have the most positive impact and legacy? And is that through traditional means or is it through more non-traditional means? And I think I'll always be asking myself that question. At this point, I feel like there's so much money in politics and so much bleh, 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 um, that, you know, if, if, if I felt that there was something that I could do that could be really impactful, um, you know, I have so many friends that are senators and Congress people. I literally, I mean, to think about being in the led legislature and having to deal with all these people and these special interests and ooh, you know having somebody being someone that actually controls a budget like a governor or a mayor is or a president is you know in certain ways is significantly more interesting to me than being a legislator but you know attempting to do things with technology and with platform is even more interesting to me right now because I think that, that there's more impact to be had and positive impact to be had in, in those spheres around social justice, around impact. So I'm exploring those really. I think I'm gonna launch a podcast actually in, in January of next year. Um, so I hope you guys will listen to it if I do. Um, it's gonna be about trying to build wealth and marginalized communities and using technology and information share and peer-to-peer -peer lending and stuff like that to try to extricate marginalized communities from these traditional predatory financial practices. Not just financial, but also, you know, all the, all the things that we can go into, but so that's, that's something I'm considering. I haven't figured out that pot, what it's going to be, but doing podcasts and things like that, there's ways to establish reach without, without traditional politics, so to speak. So we'll see. And if you do run, let me know. You have my vote. Oh, thank you. You know, I think this is a great start. My, I my want vote you to, is, uh, yeah. I want be. you to, you, you know, you run my campaign. You, you, you know, you leave, leave I wish. And, and run my campaign. I wish. You can always go back. Just take a sabbatical. Just take a <laughs> Deal. <laughs> and follow up question uh, for, from different angle. Uh, in your movie, uh, uh, The Visit, um, main character uh, is trapped in, in cell, yet he is having moments when, when his imagination takes over and he can... Uh, project certain situations, character that is, uh, who are coming to, 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 to visit him. Uh, do you in your, in your everyday life um, use imagination as a, as a tool uh, uh, for changing the, the energy, changing the dynamic, changing the atmosphere of, of, of the given day? Um, Great question. Is, is, is uh, the, the imagination present in your life um, yeah. as a tool? I call it creative visualization and self-talk. Mm -hmm. And so what the person that will talk, the person that talks to us most throughout our lives are ourselves. We hear that voice inside our head constantly. It's constantly running. And oftentimes it's running so much that we subconsciously forget about it, but it's still there. So making your self-talk conscious is critical, I believe, to 
amplifying your ability to, to make more courageous choices in your life. And, and being able to creatively visualize a different space if you don't like the reality or space you're in at the time is very important. Shakti Guy Wan is a kind of a spiritual leader who, who for years has talked about creative visualization, wrote a book about it. Um, but there's so many people that talk about it. And it's just about visualizing something different or being creative in the visual because that also lends to more creativity. It's like a, creativity is like a muscle. And the more creative you are, the more different creative tools you use. Even if you don't consider yourself a great painter, for instance, getting a canvas or, or a sketchbook and sketching and painting starts to unleash other creative pathways in your brain. It's not that you're doing it because you were going to be, you're going to sell these pictures. It's that you're, you're increasing your creative outlets and, and things and your ability to flow and follow creativity. The same holds true with visualizing something that you want to manifest. And the same holds true with uh, repetitive self-talk. And so I attempt to do um, uh, affirmations on a daily basis. And um, one I love to do is, is I say to myself, I will not, and I repeat it, I will not allow fear to stop me from making the choices that I already know I should make. Instead, I will act with my heart, with courage, um, and in so doing, give others permission to be courageous as well. I will win um, in my, at my choices. I will manifest my destiny. So that affirmation right there is a beautiful one um, that can remind you to be courageous and don't listen to other people's projected talk, but be more mindful of your own self-talk and your own creative visualization. And I'll just be very honest. Oftentimes, parents and your friends can be the biggest dream killers of all because we give, we give their projected talk more weight because, um, and oftentimes, it's, it's, it's the most conservative talk. And why do I say that? The reason why is because they love us so much, they don't want to see us get hurt. So they actually try to uh, dissuade us from risk which is the exact opposite of what we should do. I'm a parent of a f almost five-year-old. He, he turns five December 19th. And I've had to be extremely conscious and mindful of not projecting my fears to the point where you go to the playground and all, almost all you hear from parents, stop, be careful, don't go up there, be careful, don't jump down, bop, my, 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 my. I'm like, oh my God, it's a, it's a wonder kids don't have a, a complex because Everything they're being told by their parents is be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. Don't, you're going to hurt yourself. Don't do that. You're going to hurt yourself. Oh my God, be careful. And I believe parents get stuck in that tape, even as you get older. Um, I noticed my mom even telling me now, are you sure you want to drive at night? I'm like, I'm a grown ass man. What do you, what, what do you, yes, I'm, yes. You know, so the point being is I try not to project fear to my son. Now I've paid the price a few times. There was a time where he was coming up to a, a really steep hill and he was on his scooter and I knew it was bad, but I did not want to say, you, you can't do it. I wanted to say, do you think going down that hill is a good choice? Do you think that's a good choice for your body and being responsible to your body? He, was, he said yes. And then I had to live with it. And I, it was horrible because he's got going too fast. He started to shake and he face planted. And if he would have broken a bone I, I don't know. I mean, he, he, was, he was screaming bloody murder, of course, but he, thank God, didn't break a bone, meaning he just got scraped and bruised. And hopefully that metaphorically is all that happens to anybody on this, on this, as you make those choices. Hopefully the worst that will happen to you is you get scraped and bruised. Hopefully you won't have a broken bone or a compound fracture or something that's horrific. I felt so guilty because I could have stopped and I probably should have. Because it's a fine line. It's not like I let my son just do anything. But that was just on that line where I was like, you know. So making those courageous choices and, and being able to not listen to projected fears from our circles, family and otherwise, I think are, is one of the most important lessons. The one way you can, you can block, help block that is to do affirmations.
Phil, where have you been my entire life? I, I was needing you so much. My father, when I told him that I would like to become an actor, he was trashing me. He became so bullistic. He was like, Act, acting, what are you talking about? Doctor of medicine, that's your, that's your future. And finally, after National Theater Academy, which I graduated from in Poland, I got a gig playing in um, a soap opera. I was playing a doctor of medicine. And I showed, it, uh, uh, showed him the, the, the episode and he was like, exactly. Exactly, okay, now I'm fine. So in a way, you, you've been listening to my advice. He <laughs> never admits he was, he was wrong, never. Yeah, you know, this is, it, it's your path, you guys, and I'm so proud of you, and I'm so hopeful um, that you will live your life and not someone else's version of your life. And, um, and if you have to let some folks out of your life for a reason in the season, that's part of the journey sometimes, you know, um, you know, and, 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 and being very mindful of their fears and being able to articulate their fears back to them and saying, hey, I know why you're saying this to me is because you're afraid for me. You're afraid that if I go out and do this, then, you know, I'll end up, you know, living in the streets and I won't be, or you're afraid of what your friends will say to you. And it's more about your perception. It's like, you want me to be a doctor so you can tell your friends that, you know, my daughter, my son graduated from very prestigious Williams College and now they're going on to Johns Hopkins to become a doctor of blah, blah, blah. That's about you, dad or mom. That's not about me. And if you want me to call up your friends because you want them to be impressed, I'm happy to have coffee with them and I'll recite some poetry to them and maybe they'll be cool. Oh, that's another thing. You guys, you have to learn a poem, at least one that you can recite at any time throughout your life. And I truly believe this. Knowing a poem is critical, no matter what you do that you can recite because it's beautiful. Because if you're in a situation where people are just starting nonsense, you say, hey, hey guys, you wanna hear a poem? You wanna hear a poem? And they're like, what are you talking about here a poem? I'm just gonna say a poem. And then, did you know a poem? You can say a poem too. And you know, it can cut through a lot of problems. So here's a poem, you guys, you wanna hear a poem? You guys wanna hear a poem? Okay, wonderful poet named Fleur Adcock. She wrote a poem as she was getting older and she was um, getting towards the back end of her life. And she decided to spend a year um, kind of in a cabin by herself. And then she wrote this incredible poem about maturing and growing older and it's called Weathering. And it goes like this. The wind from the snow line catches my face and it flushes with a flush that will never wholly settle. Well, that was a metropolitan vanity wanting to look young forever to pass. I was never a pre-Raphaelite beauty and only pretty enough to be seen with men who were willing to be seen with passable women. But now that I'm in love with a place that doesn't care how I look or if I'm happy, happy is how I look and that's all. My hair will grow gray in any case, my nails chip flake, my waist thicken, and the years will work all their usual changes. But if it's little enough lost to be, to spend a year, and this is interesting, I haven't, I haven't recited this poem in like 20 years. Uh, it's little enough lost to be, uh, to escape among lakes and fells and to look out over the, in the years work all their usual changes and to look out over the high mountain pass above Ooh, I can't remember the last line that's so good. Um, it's a line that talks about, and this is what I wanted to say. This is what I just, I just, I hadn't thought about this poem in years, but I thought about, about this discussion. Uh, we'll, we should look it up. But the last line basically says, um, I'm happy to look in the reflection. It's like my new reflection. In other words, she's saying, when I look in the mirror, I see the reflection of my soul, which is much better than the reflection of my body or something. Somebody look it up while we're talking and we could finish, you know, when we finish, we can read oh. the exact 
the exact line is much better. The exact final line of the poem is much better than where I should, but it's about, or to what it looks, that's something like, whatever, we'll look it up. Point is, that's one poem. I know a bunch of poems, but learn any poem. It doesn't matter who is, whose poem it is, whether it's old or new, but just know a poem, know one poem. I, you know, I'd like to learn a bunch of them, but, but just know them. And even if you don't become an actor, just know, just know a poem, please, know a poem. I think that maybe that should be the title of my next book, Know a Poem. We'll definitely make sure to find a poem. <laughs> find I, a think, poem. I think we have uh, time for one more question. Does anyone have a burning question they'd like to ask? It's got to be burning. Burning. I just want to point out that everyone in Professor Sangara's class already has an imagination poem known by heart because that was our first project. It's amazing. See? So he's helping us out. You, okay, someone give me a poem, please. Give me your, Danny, give me your poem. Okay, the poem that we did in class, it's The Imagination, that's our app. The Imagination teaches us our limits and how to, and how to, oh my God, and how to go beyond those limits. The Imagination says, listen to me. I am your darkest voice. I am your 4 a.m. voice. I am the voice that wakes you up and says, this is what I'm afraid of. The imagination is there to, oh no. Sort out your nightmare. To show you the exit from the maze of your nightmare, to transform your nightmares into dreams that become your bedrock. The imagination is not our escape. On the contrary, the imagination is the place we're all trying to get to. And that is a fragment from uh, uh, Six Degrees of Separation uh, by John Guare. Ooh, I love it. Okay, so that relates to this poem. The end goes, that's little enough lost for bargain for a year among lakes and fells where simply to look out over the window at the high pass makes me indifferent to mirrors and to what my soul may wear over its new complexion. Um, makes me indifferent to mirrors or to what my soul may wear over its new complexion. So remember, you're so much more than what you see when you look in the mirror. In fact, even question what you see when you look in the mirror. I, I, I question every day. I don't think the way we see ourselves is how we actually look because it's hard with our eyeballs to see our souls. You know, we have to sense them and see them with a different eye or a different sense. And, you, and you're much more soul and energy and, and imagination in that, in that poem that was just beautifully recited by Danny than what you can see with your eyeballs. And that's true for everybody you see. And so digging deeper below the surface, what's, what's that new complexion? Who are you? Who are you really? Not who did society tell you you are, not who did a po po you know, like a, a, a role or, or tell you you are. Obviously, um, you're so much more than that, you know, and you're magnificent and you're incredible. And uh, celebrate that in yourself. You know, it's beautiful. And watch The Good Doctor every Monday night. That's important. Hill, uh, I, I knew about many talents of yours, but you are also a magician. Thank you for creating the, the, the space of, of magic poetry and, and, and something that is truly um, special. My favorite poem is by uh, Wisława Szymborska, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Polish um, uh, writer. The title is Nothing Can Ever Happen Twice. Mm. And I believe that what you gave us was uh, remarkable, unique, and um, I'm truly grateful you found the time in your busy schedule to, to meet with us and to, to celebrate this special day uh, nationwide uh, with us. Thank you indeed. Thank you, you guys. Um, Thank you. You know, the beautiful thing about technology is that we're all connected. So if there's anything any of you guys are ever doing, I get a lot of DMs, but if you DM me, I can try to I maybe yeah, I have to do it more than once. I may see it at some point. If I don't see it, don't get mad at me. But the point is, is that 
if, if you're doing something that I can support and help, I'm happy to do that. And, and remember, you know, Dr. King said, we're all tied together in a single garment of mutual destiny. So we're all in this together. And I'm so appreciative to, to cut out some Saturday afternoon time to talk with you guys and, and really appreciate your, uh, your energy. And Professor Omar, um, I'm going to look up this poem because I want to see it. Who's, who's the poet again? Wieslawa Szymborska. Uh, nothing can ever happen twice. Okay. Uh, the sorry fact is that we arrived here improvised and live, live without the chance to practice. That's mm. it. I found it. First memo. It's you simple. It's beautiful. Her poetry is nothing to overwhelm you with but lets you think, reflect, and actually invites you to, to intellectual and emotional dance with her. She was well, I'm, I'm gonna memorize this poem and the next time we see ourselves in, if, in person, when we do, I'm sure that future holds that. Any of us, when, if we ever bump into each other, ask me to recite this poem and I, hopefully I'll know it. And I will do my homework and will uh, memorize yours. Perfect. To the club. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, you guys. Thank, Thank you, you Hill. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Truly appreciate it. Thank you so much.